This is the uh, last lecture I'm going to make today, but not the last in the series. This is lecture number five, and I'm going to talk um, briefly about the educational philosophy of Yad Vashem, which is very important because that's where uh, the world's scholars look for the most uh, definitive uh, facts, information, and um, uh, documents and archives and history of the Holocaust. Documentation is there more extensive than anywhere else in the world. How do we tell the human story of the victim? That's the challenge that Yad Vashem says that we as educators have and you as learners have. We need to be able to teach about the Holocaust and life before the Holocaust because it is a human story about people living within the core of a civilized world, what we thought was a civilized world. Students like yourself should be uh, taken to the point where you look at the literature and when you read about the personal experiences of survivors and people who went through it, you say to yourself, how am I alike these people? In what way are we alike? And you'll find many commonalities. They had brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, aunts, uncles, aspirations, dreams and hopes, careers, and so on, just like you and I have. The Jewish youth is an important group to look at. Before World War II, 50% of the Jewish youth in Europe belonged to some kind of a Jewish youth movement, uh, where they, their, their main goal was to see how can young people make the world better, how can they change the world for the better. In the ghettos, it was the young people who started the underground schools, theaters, music. They were all started by youth. These were the things they did before the war, and they were going to continue them even if the Nazis said they couldn't. So it's important that we give the Holocaust a face, rather than just look at the sheer number 6 million, or 10 million, or 11 million. We begin with the human story. In the ghetto, human beings being forced to live on less than 200 calories a day. We look at a particular ghetto or two, rather than look at all the ghettos, to get a feel for what was it like for the individual in the ghetto. That's why we study the Warsaw Ghetto, to get a, 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 a view of what life was like in the typical ghetto, and Warsaw being the largest one is a perfect uh, case study. We have to look at their life, their conditions, how they manage to survive, how they live, and how they cope with the conditions and the restrictions in the ghetto. We have to look at how doctors face moral dilemma, dilemmas daily in the ghetto and how people had to face moral dilemmas every day of their life. Dilemmas that Lawrence Langer, Holocaust scholar, literary scholar and uh, critic, calls um, choiceless choices that everyday people were forced into situations where they had to make one choice or another. Neither one of the choices under normal conditions would have been a rational decision or choice that somebody would have made. The Jews documented life in the ghetto so that the world in the future would understand what happened to them. So that the world would understand it is why we look at their literature. I have you read individual literature because it's important that you begin to empathize and under try to feel or get into the feelings of what they had. However, I'll never ask you, what would you have done, because that's inappropriate. No one knows what they would have done under those circumstances. The victims themselves didn't know how they would act until they were in those situations. And you know, in genocide, the Holocaust, it didn't matter how much the victims tried, because the goal was to eventually murder them all. So it's important for us to learn not what they did, but how did it end. Develop compassion by looking at two central questions. One is, what is the meaning of life after Auschwitz? And two, why didn't they seek revenge? Many of us think we would have sought revenge. Well, things mean different things to different people. And in this particular case, words like hungry, alone, unhappy. After Auschwitz, those words 
had a different meaning for survivors. You and I should never know what the word hunger means to a survivor, or alone means to a survivor. Our definition of those words will never come near what it means to them after a place like Auschwitz. As far as revenge is concerned, most survivors got their revenge by continuing a continuation of their Jewish life and culture. From 1946 to 1948, in Bergen-Belsen DP camp alone, displaced persons camp after the war, 2,500 uh, 2, babies were born. Their revenge was to build new lives, new families, a new culture, and begin life anew in a new land where they were free to practice their religion. So the more we learn and the more we know, we must acknowledge what we don't know about the Holocaust. The day I stop being a student of the Holocaust is the day I stop being an effective educator of the Holocaust. Because no matter how much scholarly work I, I, I immerse myself in, it always seems that I come out and there's more and more to know, to learn, and to grapple with and to try to understand. History and memory are two different things. Words disappear because they don't convey the true nature of the Holocaust. One of the phenomenon that you're asked to look at as you study the Holocaust is the uh, behavior of bystanders and perpetrators. What made some people stand by and watch the annihilation of another group of people simply because of their religion? What made the perpetrator do what they did? What was going on in their mind? As far as bystanders are concerned, you as a learner, as a student of the Holocaust, may not think at first that the bystander did anything wrong. And when one thinks about it, we need to realize that we are all bystanders at different times during our life. So what we're hopefully learning from our study of the Holocaust is not necessarily special, specific lessons, but learning sensitivity. To become sensitized, to acknowledge that something is wrong, and when you see it wrong, take action. A perfect example that everyone is aware of is Schindler's List. Yes, people call Oscar Schindler a profiteer, a womanizer, and not a German industrialist. Yeah, he was all of those things. He was a lousy businessman. He failed at every business he, he tried. He was a womanizer and cheated on his wife, they'll say. But he also saved 1,300 Jews. And one has to look and say, at what point did Oscar Schindler make the transition, the change, from being a a war profiteer and an industrialist to a righteous person whose only goal was to save these 1300 human beings. There was a point when Oscar Schindler stopped being what he was and became very much involved with the survival of his Jews, the Schindler Jews. I think you should keep that in mind when you watch Schindler's List. Schindler's List is one of the better movies uh, out on the Holocaust because it is very accurate in what it depicts. And this I know from having met with um, uh, a set of survivors who were, in fact, in his factory and on his list and are alive today and married to each other because of Oscar Schindler. So with that, I'm going to bring this lecture um, on educational philosophy at Yad Vashem to a close. Uh, I've kind of capsulized it very briefly, but I think you start to get a feeling for where I'll be going with the rest of this course.